allegations of state involvement in so-called black-on-black violence. Braced for the onslaught of a third state of emergency, the United Democratic Front looks back on the struggle since the inception of the UDF in 1983. sweeping powers of the state of emergency, an estimated 30,000 people, the majority black, have been detained. Independent reporting on security force activity, community resistance and detentions has been banned. Only government statements, as released by the State Bureau of Information, may be reported. Across South Africa, the struggle survives in the black townships through a network of underground structures. Street committees, civic associations, student and labor movements, although heavily beleaguered by state action, continue to prevent the implementation of neo-apartheid reforms. Since September 1984, over 2,000 people, almost all black, have lost their lives in this phase of the struggle. In the polluted townships, security force action has been responsible for at least 50% of these deaths. State recruitment of informers, vigilantes and hit squads has introduced an insidious dimension, giving rise to conflict within black communities. In the removed white suburbs, government-controlled media has long manipulated and shaped uninformed white opinion. In the absence of press freedom, conflict within the black community is misrepresented by the state through promotion of the emotive concept of so-called black-on-black violence. Good evening, in tonight's program we'll be looking at the issue of black on black violence and related matters. Ignorant white prejudice is reinforced in the false belief that endemic violence within the black community is a natural consequence of black tribalism and communist inspired agitation. I want to say this, it's got nothing to do with government policies, it's got nothing to do with apartheid or anything like that, it's got to do with the commitment of the ANC, uh, communist manipulated entities, to control the population. In this way, the direct relationship between community violence and government methods used to impose neo-apartheid structures is emotively obscured. Crossroads, May 1986. This impression of blacks killing blacks in seeming indiscriminate revolutionary violence was pumped across South Africa nightly in television news broadcasts. Presented under a banner of so-called black-on-black violence, this situation was portrayed as a battle between the forces of revolution represented by the young comrades and a community of moderates resisting intimidation. But what was the relationship in this conflict set up by the South African security forces with the conservative Wittdukker? so named for their white cloth armbands. In May and June of 1986, the Wittdukke invaded and destroyed the four satellite squatter camps in the vicinity of the old crossroads site. Why were plainclothes policemen, like this one, seen meeting with armed Wittdukke vigilantes before attacks took place? Eyewitness reports testify to direct participation by security forces, known as Boers, in these attacks. What actually happened is that when the, the Bedukas were retreating and of course the residents gaining upper hand, the, the plain clothes, clothes and uniformed, uniformed clothes, clothes policemen, policemen they, they emerged from, from the group, group and they started, started shooting, shooting at us. us. And, and we retreated, we had to run, run away. Could he describe what happened when his house was burnt, who burnt it and what he saw? The worst of the allegations were that the mainly the police and to a lesser extent the military, the military had, had assisted in the attacks on the camps, camps. And, and by assisted the affidavits go on to say that, that the police had burned down, down shacks, shacks, that they'd, they'd fired, fired on people, that they had driven, driven assisted the attacking Vitoko or vigilantes in driving the people, the, people, the, the residents out of the camps. camps. The, the boys were giving them arms, 
and the person was dead, they would they must bring their identity documents. And what will really happen? They will hand over their identity documents and the boss will give them arms. And the condition was that they will get their the identity documents back on the condition that they return the firearms. On the 26th of May, community leaders assembled here took legal action to prevent South African security forces from further attacking their camps. Of four satellite camps, only KTC remained standing. Nyanga Bush, Portland Cement, and Nyanga Extension had been totally destroyed by a Dukka actively supported by security forces. I asked them why they did this to the people when they get to fight. Is it for giving the answer? They chase me away, away and then they promise me they will make the gun, they can shoot me. And, and now, now when, when they move away, they move away from, from them, them, and then the police, they start to, to do burn the houses. houses. And then they, when, when they build they go to defend the houses, houses for them, and then the police, they start to shoot to, to dead them. And then this is a stop to do this. And all the time they do to do it, they come back with the police. When the police, they finish to chase the people, and then they come back with the houses. What, what I say, say it, it was, was just a shot, shot from, from the police. I did, I did not, not see them, them stopping them, them that they must not bend their houses. houses. Who, Who were the police, police shooting at? Who were the, the police shooting, shooting at? I do not know. The police were shooting, shooting on our side, side standing, standing on the very side. side. Three camps totally destroyed, the Supreme Court ordered the South African security forces to refrain from attacking the remaining KTC camp and to take all necessary steps to protect the camp and its residents. Two weeks later, Vitduka, supported by security forces, attacked this Zolani refugee center and then invaded the KTC camp. 9th of June, morning, we saw meeting police South Africa police and South Africa defense force in meeting there and met with the administration board office. After that, he came straight away to KTC. Police walking in front of the police. Come and Houses, there were also allegations that when persons were trying to group together and drive off the Vitoka or to make a concerted effort to rescue their property, that the police either opened fire on them or tear gassed them. With the destruction of the KTC camp, the security operation was complete. 75,000 unwanted people were now homeless their only option to move to the government-appointed relocation site at Kaya After 11 years, the South African government had finally succeeded in removing the satellite squatter community that had developed around the old crossroads squatter site. On the 8th of August, the Minister of Law and Order declined his option to oppose the court order implicating the South African security forces in this operation. The state, the state and, the, and police the police exploited, exploited a situation, situation in changing existed. existed. In order, in order to, to for various, various reasons, reasons, to drive, to drive out, out the residents in that area, area uh, to, to in effect, 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 effect force, force removal, removal without the, the, the political, political embarrassment, embarrassment of the state, state having to do so. so. That made it led to us, us that, that the police to police they were chasing us there, there. Because they were the one who was to Kailisha. Even now, now, the government, they told us we must go to Kailisha. Where we told them we don't want to go there. We want to stay there on that place. Kaya situated on the desolate southern tip of the Cape Flats, is over 30 kilometers away from employment opportunities. It is government intention to relocate some 350,000 blacks to this area. Kwandebele, 1986, the year of Mbogoto a brutal strong-arm vigilante force formed by Bantustan authorities intent on imposing apartheid-style independence. Violence flared as the Kwandebele people resisted, taking on the marauding Mbogoto and their covert allies, the security forces. The eyes of our people here, you know, they aligned the security forces with the Mbogoto, because they, they, they always said, 
these people are backing up the Imbogoto. Look, the, the, the Imbogoto is armed and they go all, I mean, go roaming the streets with arms and uh, unlicensed arms, but the security forces do not, you know, arrest them, don't take them to, to task on that. Now, that shows that they are with them. On occasions, uh, this uh, force were moving with Imbogoto in the first place. When Imbogoto getting into our place, they were escorting by, for, by the security force, you see? That's, that, 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 that's, that's what amazes us, you see? Mutsa, a well-developed enclave of Pedi villages, ceded by Pretoria to Kwandebele, the Bantustan authorities' reward for taking independence. To crush opposition to this incorporation, Mbogoto press-ganged Indebele men and took them to plunder Mutsa villages. Many peoples of Kwandebele died on the other side there because they took them, some of them, they were drunk, they took them from the bars, from the shebins, you see, and put them in some lorries and said, we are going to fight. On top of that, they took, uh, you see, uh, liquor. The police said, no, if you are afraid to fight because you are not brave enough, they said, no, you must drink a little bit, then you'll have to fight, you see. That's how uh, most of the killing, most of the people killing the, the, the Kwandevele peoples, it happened just like that. In 1986, in Kwandebele, to oppose independence was to become a victim of Mbogoto methods. These men were among 300 Mutsa residents abducted in the presence of police and security forces by Mbogoto in the early hours of New Year's Day. Severely injured, the captives were loaded into trucks and taken to the Siwa Buswa community hall. In the presence of police and ministers of the Kwandebele Legislative Assembly, they were systematically beaten and tortured. We are severely injured, so we are just taken and then taken into their lorries, then to their, to their places. In fact, we didn't know what's, what was happening really, because even the police were around. The policemen came just to, to rescue their children. They took them along and then they left us in the, in the hall. And then thereafter, we stand that way, tortured by the robot. Well, the police were just around, and they, it would seem that uh, they were on the side of these Bogotos. That is, they wanted the Bogotos to defeat us and take us to their place. But because it was said that uh, we refused to be incorporated to the Kwandevele people or to the Kwandevele government. On the 12th of August, Mbogoto was defeated and independence officially shelved. After months of ominous silence, bloodshed has again flared with the government announcement of proposed independence, validating fears expressed by Prince James Mashlangu, subsequently detained for his opposition to independence. Our people here uh, are still suspicious that this thing of uh, independence is still on and the Imbogoto is still alive and so on. And why do they say so is because uh, the chief minister has said nothing about uh, the, the, the independence and the um, Pretoria as well has said nothing, you know, they are just silent. Now that raises some suspicions that now this, uh, they, are, they might be up to something. Besieged by security forces on the night of Tuesday 22nd of April, Alexandra Township was attacked by mobs of balaclava clad men. Heavily armed, they attacked the homes and families of anti-apartheid activists, burning, maiming, and murdering. By morning, at least eight activists were dead and over 60 people injured. Claims of security force involvement in these attacks included eyewitness reports of military personnel carriers moving in support of the attackers, who were dressed in police-type uniforms and included white men with blackened faces. By the end of the Alexandra massacre, 21 people had been killed. Assassination attacks by vigilante death squads targeting anti-apartheid activists were now a regular feature of township life. On the night of Tuesday the 3rd of June, during attacks on the homes of activists in Katlehong and Tokoza townships, one of the 13 vigilantes involved was captured and publicly confessed to being a paid assassin enlisted by the South African Security Police. So he says he's uh, Abram Zwane uh, from uh, Katlehong. 
Abraham Zwani, an unemployed 19-year-old from Katlehong Township, told the media he was paid by police to participate in attacks on black activists over the past three months. Uh, he says uh, uh, security, uh, police, and uh, with traveling in uh, two kumbis with uh, other private cars, XR6, uh, arrived uh, at his uh, place. But he gave me Radgu Guntatawal, but he knew who put out the Chabula and his one and Sand, who in the Usho Nil. They approached him and said, uh, uh, Porta would be very happy if uh, Comrade Sesh here, uh, if Porta has that Comrade Sesh here is dead. So they must uh, uh, undergo that operation to eliminate bad elements in our township. And rightly, we are to add that also, also, I'm going to be saying that we are going to be saying that we are going to be saying that we are going to be saying that there's a guy called uh, Axites uh, for Aaron. Uh, actually, he approached him. And then uh, he said he'll come back uh, uh, to him with, uh, an, with an amount of about uh, 500 rands. After a spate of petrol bomb attacks on houses in the Deep Kloof area of Soweto, during the night of Thursday, May the 8th, 1986, the home of Mr. and Mrs. Mabaso was attacked by a group of white men posing as blacks. I peeped through the window because all the lights, outside lights were on. I saw him wearing a black beret with hair overlapping at the back white man's head. He was placing a rifle on the ground and a bucket, a gray plastic bucket full of petrol. He threw the petrol through the window, whilst I was peeping, threw the petrol through the window and then took out one of his gloves uh, in, in order to take out a match which was used by him to, uh, to burn the house. Uh, I said, when he struck the match, I said to him, because I saw that uh, his, although his face was painted black, but his hand was white. Then I started shouting at him. I said, what manje in Africans? I don't know, do you understand Africans? What manje? And then he got scared. And then he, because he, in fact he was prepared to do his job, he threw the, the mesh through the window, the stick, uh, mesh stick through the window. And then I said to, we, uh, to him, and then that was enough to make him fed up. He took the rifle. I saw him moving backwards, but shooting all the, all the time. Kept on shooting. He moved right towards shooting, moved left towards shooting. And then when I could no longer see him through the window, so I decided to go to peep through the fan because there's a fan at the door. So it's how I saw him run to the yellow van, which was parked at the corner. So it right drove at a very high speed, avoiding this place, went up the main road to this side. Although I cannot say it is that fellow, but the following day, when the police came here, one of them, the two men who came into the house, one of them I saw, that, in fact, was very uh, similar to, was, in fact, he resembled the very fellow who attacked this house, even the height and the physical uh, appearance, in the phys his physical uh, features. Because those police uh, did not like that what appeared in the newspaper, you see. Although they could not uh, uh, charge us for that, but they did not like it. Well, I knew that in fact they didn't like it because I am the one who exposed them. They have been posing as blacks, attacking blacks during the night. So I am the only person who exposed them because I saw them. Atridgeville, September the 18th. A child was killed when a bomb thrown through the bedroom window of the Ladwaba home exploded in the early hours of the morning. Somebody next door. I mean, uh, before the explosion, he saw two soldiers. The other one was wearing a black uh, uh, jacket. Then they got inside the, the neighbor's uh, gate. Apparently, he saw he's an activist too. So he woke up and then, I mean, through the window, he could see uh, two white men. Then they just, they, they passed his, uh, wind, his window, I mean, next to uh, that wall there. And then after some while, after some time, and then he, he, he had an explosion. Within two, three minutes, the whole house was surrounded by soldiers and police. And then 
we were just outside and then he started hitting us and then uh, when we asked why why are they hitting us he says uh, we must know where this bomb come from in fact they refused us to uh, to start the van to take that one who was badly injured to hospital they told us no we will get you an ambulance it took about an about 45 minutes to an hour waiting for that ambulance and then those people were just out with a hippo so uh, after after an hour i mean that that uh, little one was in fact who died he was just outside there fatally wounded by flying shrapnel which hit him in the stomach and after lying outside unattended while waiting for a state ambulance 16 year old walter ledwaba died on the way to hospital one more state statistic of so-called black community violence Midnight, Tuesday the 16th of September, 15-year-old Ponzo Mngadi was abducted from his Soweto home by a group of 20 men armed with revolvers, pangas and butcher knives. Around about quarter past 12 to half past 12, came some guys, they knocked around the house here, yeah. they identified themselves as policemen. But when, when they entered, they asked, where is Ponzo? If you can't find Bonzo, we'll take one of your family. Then he'll, he'll show us where Bonzo used to go. When they find him sleeping here, yeah, I was sleeping on the floor, not even on the couch. He just opened the blankets. So here's the one. They took him. Our focus was picking about four houses away from me. See? They took him. Put him in the car. Well, I don't know whether in the boot or in front with them. They go with him. Later on, we met somebody with a van. Uh, we stop him. I stop him, actually. I said, hey, hey, man, will you please help us? There's, you see those workers, they've adopted. Okay. Well, English, I'm not. Well, they've, take, they've taken my my nephew. Same time, the guy goes down, just around the in, just around the corner. Came back after after five minutes. So you know those people, they've got uh, a warrant of arrest. So you now they can come here and search the house. If they find that guy, they must take him. And they can do what they can do with him. The telephone wires to the house having been severed, the distressed family watched helplessly as their 15-year-old nephew was forcibly removed in the dead of night. Ponzo's mutilated body was identified two days later at the government mortuary. After a couple of minutes, they called me. I must go in point. And I go there. No, this is Bonzo. Here, he got a couple of stitches. Yeah, like this. And then there's one here. And then there's a, one big one. It is it's a hole, deep hole here. Then there are another one. I don't know how many with it. And here, this side. As if they were just. Ponzo Ngadi's murder was allegedly sanctioned by a police warrant and the subsequent independent action of a police officer. Since 1984, black youths have been in the front line of the liberation struggle in South Africa. In this time, thousands of black children have been systematically brutalized by security force action in the townships. Since the declaration of the first state of emergency on June the 26th, 1985, between 10 and 14,000 black children 18 years and under have been detained. Evidence of physical and mental torture has been apparent in the majority of children surveyed on release from detention. These children shown here were detained by police and kept naked, 52 in a cell, over a period of four days. At random they were taken out and beaten repeatedly by policemen wielding clubs, rifles, wire whips and shambucks. 
Paulus. How old are you, Paulus? Sixteen years, sir. Who hit you like? Who did this to you? Who hit you? The uh, policeman. Uh, uh, Miraculously, Polis expresses no immediate feelings of hate or revenge. More common in the brutalized child is a smoldering bitterness and the potential for his transformation into a violent individual, seeking revenge from a society he sees as unjust and cruel. A society so sick that cases of detained children being forced to kiss corpses in police mortuaries have been recorded. Most of these uh, young people are very, very young. Many of them are prepubescent or just out of puberty. What they have experienced in that short time at their very tender years, whole societies have not experienced elsewhere in the world. They have witnessed brutality, they have been brutalized themselves, and there's a short gap between witnessing it, it happening to you, and you beginning to commit that yourself. Those conditions are bound to give rise to violent expressions. Those expressions tend to reflect themselves against fellow blacks rather than the ruling class because the ruling class is inaccessible. You cannot assail the defense force. You cannot attack the police force and still survive. So you look for somebody who is more accessible. And it began against collaborators. The legacy of apartheid is insidious and complex. Informers, vigilantes and members of the community co-opted into neo-apartheid structures become targets to those elements so brutalized by security force action that they now seek only to kill and burn in blind revenge. The necklace, retribution by fire, a manifestation of the sickness of apartheid legacy. This horror has received much local and international currency emotively obscuring the direct relationship between government action and violence within the black community. Can you really blame such young people? And you're talking about 11 to 13 year olds largely who have been committing some of these things. And can they be responsible themselves? And nowhere in, in any uh, legal system in the world do you hold children responsible largely for actions. And here you're dealing with large groups of youngsters. You have to hold a society responsible, and the people responsible for that society are the Nationalist Party government in this country. All-powerful, the South African government controls the media to such an extent that it can dictate, unchallenged, the interpretation of day-to-day -day events within South Africa. Backed by the influence of a single, state-controlled television monopoly, the South African government feeds the insecurity of its misinformed white electorate, focusing their obsessions on a carefully manipulated negative image of the African National Congress, whilst pursuing, unbridled, the violent implementation of its neo-apartheid reforms. And this is what's happening. Uh, large sections of the ruling class don't have an inkling of what is happening in the townships. And when they do, probably it'll be too late. A wound there, obviously trying to prevent, and a wound there obviously trying to protect. But again, typically the same thing at the back. The late Dr. Fabian Ribeiro, known as the People's Doctor, he attended to many victims of security force violence, encouraging them to take legal action against the state. For this, he became a target. On the 12th of March, 1986, Dr. Ribeiro, his wife and their two-year-old granddaughter narrowly escaped death when their house was attacked allegedly by security forces in the early hours of the morning. There was a flame in our bedroom, you see. Uh, whether there was a thud or not, I don't know, but we immediately said bomb, you see, because we expected this sort of thing to happen, you see. And we had arranged an escape route. Obviously, this was meant to incinerate us, you see. We had to run downstairs, you see, and meet the fire coming up and we would be trapped. A second attempt was made a few months later. The second attempt uh, was when a certain officer Schultz was stationed at Mamlodi police station then, uh, told some fellows who were comrades then, 
but after, after the arrest, uh, Schultz offered them freedom on condition that they come and plant a, a bomb in my father's surgery or his house. Or alternatively, if they come and shoot him. So fortunately, those fellows came and told my father. A third attempt on the life of Dr. Ribeiro was uncovered in September 1986, when the assassin, allegedly sent by police from Tembisa, confessed to Dr. Ribeiro and his family and asked for their assistance. He told us that uh, he's been sent from, he's been sent by Tembisa police to come and plant a bomb in my father's surgery. So uh, he was reluctant to do it. And he offered us, at least he asked us help uh, to get him out of Mamalori. Because he was not the only one who was sent to, to do it on that date. That there were others who were also sent to come and kill my father. Monday, the evening of December the 1st, 1986, Dr. Fabian and Mrs. Florence Ribeiro were gunned down and murdered by two assassins at their home in Mamalodi. Two vehicles were seen in the vicinity of the house prior to the shooting. The first, a white Nissan Skyline, has been positively linked to a South African security police officer. The second, a Land Rover, used as one of the getaway vehicles, belongs to a former Rhodesian Salu scout. Standing roughly 100 meters down the street, Chris Ribeiro saw his parents returning home from the surgery. A few minutes later, two men, one positively identified as a white man, came running from the house and climbed into a car parked outside in the street. Believing them to be burglars, Chris Ribeiro ran to the getaway car and opened the driver's door. So I ran towards him and as I tried opening the driver's door, the passenger fired on me. Fired, well, I heard two shots. The second passing just a few millimeters past my left eye. I ran off and I saw the car speeding off. And when it ran back home, I found my father slumped to the drain and my mother lying in the courtyard. Contrary to eyewitness reports, the Government Bureau of Information immediately issued the statement that the killers were two black men. I saw that one of the assailants was a white, white man. Large-scale unemployment and poverty amongst the black community provide fertile ground for state recruitment. 2,000 so-named instant constables, after three months' training, have been deployed in townships across the country, armed with guns and shambucks, to take on the black youth. With these instant constables acting as one more buffer between Pretoria and the oppressed masses, potential for violent conflict within the community grows to be interpreted to the world by government media as more black-on-black -black violence. As I pointed out earlier, the UDF is a legal non-violent front uh, consisting of many, many affiliates. At the moment, it is virtually impossible uh, to campaign outside of parliament uh, and to use non-violent uh, legal strategies. In fact, uh, the recent regulations that were passed at the end of, uh, in, at the middle of, during the middle of December has effectively rendered all forms of extra-parliamentary opposition illegal. Now, the UDF is increasingly being pushed, therefore, on the wrong side of the law, not by choice, but uh, of necessity. Uh, we will do everything in our power to keep the UDF alive because we honestly believe that the UDF must be the last possible hope for a relatively peaceful transformation to democracy in this country. Saturday, August the 20th, 1983, at the Rockland Civic Centre on Mitchell's Plain near Cape Town, an estimated 10,000 people 
celebrate the national launch of the United Democratic Front. Over 1,000 delegates, representing some 575 organizations, attend this historic launch of the broadest alliance of anti-government groups since the Congress Alliance of the 1950s. Committed to a single, non-racial and unfragmented South Africa, the UDF's immediate aim is to oppose the implementation of constitutional reforms designed to grant so-called coloreds and Indians limited parliamentary representation whilst ensuring total black exclusion from the political decision-making process. We believe that South Africa is one nation and we are willing to demonstrate that belief in our nationhood. The apartheid line is not at all abolished, it is simply shifted so as to include those so-called coloreds and Indians who are willing to cooperate with the government. And we are here under the banner of UDF to galvanize our forces, to move forward like an enormous phalanx, like an enormous force to say no to the quarrel of bill, to say no to the constitutional laws, and to say no to the pseudo dispensation. UDF at its inception uh, set itself the, the task of rendering the tricameral parliament and the black local authorities ineffective. November 1983, referendum day. Ceremoniously casting his vote, Prime Minister Boerta receives an overwhelming endorsement for his new constitution from the all-white electorate. With customary disregard for black opinion and arrogant intolerance to opposition, the Nationalist Party government confirmed their intention to impose their new constitution. It also means that we will take further steps as to evolutionary reform that those peoples who form a different, uh, who, who needs a different constitutional development in South Africa. Well, let me say this. Irrespective of the Pacific's power, this constitution is going to be implemented. And I believe that most colored people will be as responsible as the white people and will come forward and accept what is being offered to them to, to improve their position in their land of birth. And the same will happen with the Indians. So I'm not, I'm not now considering negative results. I'm in a positive spirit at present, as you can see. August the 19th, 1984, in a massive show of rejection for the new constitution, the UDF celebrates its first anniversary before a crowd of over 3,000 supporters. Calling on coloreds and Indians to boycott the forthcoming elections, in one year the UDF has grown to a membership of over 2 million with 648 affiliates. When the UDF declared war against the new constitution, it was declaring war against apartheid. Designed to entrench white supremacy through the illusion of so-called reforms, for South Africa's voteless black majority, the new constitution guarantees the political exclusion envisioned by Dr. Favut's apartheid Bantustan policy. Elections for the colored and Indian chambers of the new tricameral parliament take place on August the 22nd and 28th, respectively. The success of the anti-election movement and their call on coloreds and Indians to boycott these elections is measured by dismal percentage polls of 18 and 16 percent respectively. In 12 months, the grassroots momentum of the UDF and the numerous campaigns of its affiliates has succeeded in discrediting the new tricameral parliament. We, the representatives of the black majority in the form of civic associations and residence organizations throughout the rural urban areas of the Transvaal, in the so-called African townships, in quotes. We, By August 1984, alternative people's structures in the form of civic associations firmly established in townships across South Africa have effectively undermined the credibility of government-appointed black local authorities. Over the three years 
since the UDF's uh, inception, uh, there has been resistance uh, to apartheid on a scale not seen uh, before. I think even in, in the 1950s, uh, when many, many people fought against apartheid, I think the difference in, in quality this time is that it's uh, much more widespread and it appears that there are many, many more uh, people involved. Historically insensitive to black opinion, the South African government, in the face of massive grassroots opposition, defiantly institute their new constitution. The inherent exclusion of any future possibility of black participation in the political decision-making process contained in this neo-apartheid reform process is a final declaration of war against the black majority of South Africa. Some of us may decide to join the struggle of, by choice because uh, we dislike apartheid, we dislike what this government stands for, and therefore we, we are involved in the anti-apartheid struggle. But many of our people join the struggle out of necessity. They are paid starvation wages, they don't have homes, they, are, they have severe problems with transport, that in fact it is impossible to live in this country if one is a black person. Sharpeville, September 3rd, 1984. A long time coming, simmering anger at the protracted day-to-day -day hardships imposed by apartheid structures erupts in violent protest as the black township communities of the Val Triangle oppose the imposition of rent increases. The South African government reacts in the only way that it knows how, with the iron fist. Violence escalates as police and army units move in to seal off the townships and the struggle against apartheid enters a new and bloody phase. We said at the time of the campaign that the new parliament was in fact going to plunge this country into a crisis. That view of the UDF has now been vindicated. The tricameral parliament really lies in ruins today. It has no legitimacy internally or externally. The black local authorities, insofar as they exist, are tottering. Throughout the country, black local authorities have collapsed. What has also been very significant uh, in the UDF's campaigns is that I think for the first time, politics in a very real sense, resistance, the, res uh, the politics of resistance has, have been taken to the remotest parts of the country. By June 1985, the South African government, fast losing control, introduces the shock military element of a state of emergency to stem the sweeping advances made by the democratic movement through coordinated action of its extensive network of youth congresses, civic associations and labor movements. Determined to force a military solution on a political crisis, with the declaration of the third state of emergency on June the 12th this year, the South African government has detained over 35,000 people. Since September the 3rd, 1984, over 2,000 people, almost all black, have lost their lives in this phase of the struggle. I think that with the emergency uh, presently, there's a clear indication that the government is trying to shift the focus and uh, to try and to, to shift the terrain rather and pull it away from the political and take it to, into, uh, towards the, the military, you know. And if one looks at the presence of the SADF in the townships, at the arming of the police all around, at the building up of what they call special constables, you know, or what we call instant constables who have only three months to be trained, and putting all those men under arms, and we actually see the, the establishment of vigilantes all around, that is, in fact, a deliberate effort, a campaign, to shift, in fact, the terrain and pull it uh, towards the, 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 the military or rather towards the... Uh, to militarize, in fact, the whole conflict in the country because at the political level, they have lost, I mean, all the initiatives. They have no political answers presently to the crisis in this country. So they think that uh, if they shift, in fact, the terrain towards the military, 
then they have a much more better chance because they have this belief that their military, I mean, the, their repressive capacity is so strong that it can conquer anything. But we know very well from the experiences of the Americans in Vietnam, you know, that um, no matter how strong the force, how strong, in fact, the government and so on, the point is that if there is no mass support, those guns, in fact, amount to nothing because they can't conquer a people, you know. They may cause harm, they may kill people and so on, but in the end, they can't, in fact, bring about political solutions. So clearly, that is where we think that we fit in as the UDF, that uh, as the government tries to shift the terrain, we are, in fact, to resist uh, being drawn towards that kind of terrain. And we have to maintain the struggle where the government is at its weakest, you know, at the political level. It may be that some of us here today will be banned. But our cry is, and always will be, you can ban us, but you cannot break us. Since the beginning of the second state of emergency, more than 25,000 people have been detained under, the, under emergency regulations. That excludes, of course, detentions in terms of specific sections of the security legislation, such as Section 29 and so on. Now, of those 25,000, our estimate is that between 70 to 80 percent of uh, those affected uh, are either executive members of uh, the United Democratic Front at a national level or at a regional level, or members uh, of affiliates or supporters of the United Democratic Front and its affiliates. And I want to warn them that if they touch the UDF, as they are preparing themselves to do, if they touch the UDF, then all the oppressed majority will conclude beyond doubt that there is no more a peaceful effort of changing South Africa. What is, I think, very important to emphasize is that the UDF has, since its inception, worked as a non-violent, legal, open organization. To the extent that we have now been, been forced, uh, literally underground, with all legal space effectively being closed. If the UDF is destroyed, it means that non-violent legal opposition would have been destroyed. The struggle as such for a non-racial democratic South Africa will not end. Uh, we just hope that non-violent peaceful means are not rendered impossible forever. <laughs>